Chapter 21 In Search of Venus The cult of beauty has perhaps never numbered among its devotees as many as it does today. Venus, today as 4,000 years ago, symbolises perfect womanhood the world over. Yet her true history for centuries remained one of history's profoundest enigmas. Even today, the whole story has not been unfolded. I went to her reputed birthplace, Cyprus, to probe the origins and reality behind the worship of the greatest goddess of classical times. Her worship and what lies behind it provide a remarkable instance of a truth that we are only rediscovering today. Much has been written in the purely historical sense, recording the later accretions surrounding Venus worship. The original spirit which moved the Phoenicians to make this legendary figure their paramount deity certainly included beauty, but it went far deeper than that. Who was Venus? Was she born in the driven sea foam of the Mediterranean, or was she born at all? Three thousand years ago, on the western coast of Cyprus, just off the coast of Asia Minor, flourished the greatest shrine of all the classical gods. This was the mighty kingdom of Paphos, ruled by Hellenic priest-kings, tending the sacred temple of Aphrodite, the foam-born one. According to Homer's Iliad, she was the daughter of Zeus and Dione, queen of the heavens, patroness of family life. Pious pilgrims journeyed here from all the Middle Eastern lands, from ancient Egypt, the Greek islands, from Greece itself, and the Levant. All brought gifts to the sacred grove. Soldiers sought victory in battle. Merchants prayed to her for success in commerce. Estranged lovers addressed to Aphrodite their prayers for reconciliation. Several thousand years before Christ, the mighty seafaring Phoenician race had migrated to Assyria from South Arabia. Their tribal system, under the guidance of energetic and capable women, was entirely matriarchal. With them to their new country they brought the goddess Ashtarath, sometimes called Ishtar. To them this woman deity represented much. She was the embodiment of the womanly virtues, nurtured their clan as a mother tends her child. As the goddess of maternity, the Phoenicians spoke of her as always carrying her son Tammuz within one arm, blessing him with the other. Yet, like the stern female warriors of their people, she protected their soldiers in war. Later, when they took to the sea, Ashtarath extended her benediction, in their mythology, over the ocean-going fleets that sailed as far as Cornwall and Carthage. This was the figure, from whom the name Esther is derived, who was carried by the Phoenician traders when they colonised Cyprus. In their legends, she was said to have been born from foam by the sea, when they reached the strangely beautiful Paphos cliffs, topped with sylvan glades, they felt that here was a place worthy of the central shrine of their great goddess. On the hills, the summer heat is always tempered by soft breezes. The beaches are indeed washed by a strange milk-white foam. In such a place it needed little imagination to believe that a goddess might be born. Ktima, then, as it was called, became the sacred sanctuary of the motherhood goddess. Her fame as an oracle spread throughout the known world of those times. The Greeks themselves admitted her to their mythology. After her miraculous birth in the foam, they said, she ascended to the heights of Mount Olympus, there to become one of the twelve Olympian deities. Standing there, looking down at the strange snow-white foam in the curving bay of Katima, one senses anew what must have been the feeling of awe that gave rise to this remarkable legend. It is not known for certain what causes the foam. Certainly I have never seen its like. The possibility is, however, that some chemical element is present on the seashore, mixed with the salty water. There is something almost eerie about it all. The Romans, when they came into contact with Aphrodite, were rapidly converted to her cult. Renaming her Venus, they were not slow to claim her as the mother of the Roman race through her son Aeneas. 
disciples of Venus among the Romans, carried her worship to the British Isles. One of her temples in this country was at Stowe, another at Corbridge in Northumberland. The mailed Venus is said to be identical with the figure of Britannia, which appears on the reverse of every penny. At all events, Aphrodite, like Britannia, was believed to rule the waves for the Phoenician men of war. One of the strangest things about Venus, however, is the development of her representation as a female figure from her original form, for at first she was nothing but a lump of grey-black stone. It seems that at the beginning of her worship she was regarded as the paramount deity. As such, the Phoenicians were afraid to make any figure to portray her, for they thought such an attempt would be bound to fail. Thus they took the black stone as a symbol, placing it in the great temple sanctuary of Paphos. Tacitus, the ancient writer, himself seems to have feared her reputed wrath when he guardedly tells his reader that the Venus of the shrine hath no human form. Until relatively recently, it was not generally known that the ancient Venus was, in fact, this conical stone. One ancient coin of Bilbus, however, gives a stylized representation of the stone in its place. From this and other evidence, plus exploration on the spot, I have been able to reconstruct the main features of the shrine. Kuklia, where the remains of the temple lie, is today a vast area of ruins. Earthquakes, Persian, Turkish and Arab conquests, and civil war have all contributed to the general desolation of what must once have been a most imposing site. Situated on a height overlooking the plain which runs down to the Mediterranean, it is one of the most charming spots on the Enchanted Isle. Still running some ten miles westward to the sea is the ancient Pilgrim Way, along which millions of worshippers have poured to the temple whose mysteries were famed throughout the classical age. Nowadays, a new road exactly follows this once-hallowed track to Ktima, fortress of the priest kings and the world's greatest pilgrim port of former times. Most of the pilgrims travelled by this route. Others, hailing from the east, disembarked at Salamis on the island's other side. Within an enormous court or enclosure stood a roofed shrine with colonnades surrounding it. Above the twin pillars of the Holy of Holies were placed sculpted doves. The stone itself stood in the centre, always draped in costly coverings. Immediately facing this was the Venus altar, upon which incense burned incessantly. Legend says that although this was always here, even the heaviest rain did not affect its burning. Upon approaching this jealously guarded holy place, the pilgrim was expected to adhere strictly to the rituals laid down by the priest king and enforced by the priestesses. At the time of the Trojan Wars, the great ruler of the kingdom of Paphos and priest of the sanctuary was named Kinneras. His dynasty ruled the country and the temple for over a thousand years. It is he who was said to have introduced the famous mysteries of ancient Egypt to the shrine and to have practiced alchemy there. There were three degrees of these mysteries performed by selected pilgrims. The first took three days. On the first day, they participated in games. On the second, they bathed in the sea in tribute to Venus. On the last occasion, bloodless sacrifices were offered to the goddess in honour of the greatness of motherhood. Women particularly prayed for beauty for themselves and for their children's success. The highest degree, to which only a few were initiated, was known as the mystery of Aphrodite and Adonis, her lover. Very little is known about this ritual, except that it emphasised the abiding beauty of love. Those who were permitted to touch the stone itself were presented with a symbol and a piece of salt. These emblems, in return for which a coin was offered, were held to be lucky charms. In the case of soldiers, they brought victory in battle. For others, they ensured the achievement of the devotee's wish. There are many mysteries of Venus still to be solved. 
Where, for instance, is the once-famed sarcophagus of Jasper Stone, which once decorated the shrine? Until the time of the Turks, it was kept in the Cathedral of St. Sophia, in the capital Nicosia. Some hundred years ago, it disappeared. The local legend in connection with this is that it fell from the skies as a bed for Aphrodite. Others held that it was created by the gods in an attempt to make an image of her. At all events, this colossal block of jasper has completely disappeared. At another spot is the reputed tomb of Venus. This forms another clue to the rites of Paphos, for there are several references to the fact that the goddess used periodically to die. This event did not take place regularly, as in the case of sun worship cults, when the sun is believed to die in winter. This, together with an increasing use of a human figure to represent the goddess, may mean another thing. There is a distinct possibility that from time to time young women were chosen to embody the attributes of Venus as a deity of love. In such cases, of course, they would die one day. Their bodies, as semi-divine creatures, might then be buried in a place of special distinction. Plausibility is lent to this by the fact that there are several reputed tombs of Venus in Cyprus. Nowadays, the black stone itself reposes in Nicosia Museum. Deep indentations upon it show where the priests used to anoint the surface in honour of their goddess. The entire surface of the cone has been worn smooth by generations of pilgrim hands. On the temple's site, immense mounds of rubble, marble columns and walls lie strewn over a great area. Secret passages on the neglected ground, apparently leading nowhere, probably mark the entrances to the chambers of the priests. But the worship of Venus still goes on. While in Cyprus, I was intrigued by reports that villagers still secretly anoint stones in her name. One friend took me to several places where, at nightfall, young girls in groups of three and four at a time entered the temple precincts. Each, with a little pot of water and a small oil-soaked rag, went to an upstanding stone to make her wish at Aphrodite's temple. Venus has again recently begun to arouse the interest of archaeologists. Some digging in the temple site has recently been undertaken, but little fresh light has been thrown upon the heyday of Aphrodite worship. Piecing together the story of Venus from the black stone of the Phoenicians to the Venus de Milo of perfect womanhood was a fascinating study and adventure. My own impression is that it is unlikely that tracing the origins of the cult beyond the Phoenicians will be possible, if it can ever be done, without extensive research in Asia Minor, and possibly even South Arabia, where the first settlements were. Turning from the remote past to the trail of the everyday present, I followed up the next important event in the lives of those charming village girls, whom I saw anointing large and small stones with rose oil, as they asked that they should be blessed with a good husband. For among the mixed population, the village folk, Greeks and Turks alike, delight in their traditional wedding ceremonies and the emphasis upon married bliss. As in every land where heavy modern industries are few, peasant life in Cyprus retains colour and delight. But here, perhaps more than any other place, the rich history of Crusaders, Saracens, Pharaohs and Venetians seems to give an ideal background to life's enjoyment. Nine out of ten Cypriots live in their picturesque mountain or lowland villages. Whether in the upland vineyards, among the oranges of the western shores, or among shepherd communities of the pine-clad Mount Olympus, home of the gods, weddings are a most important affair. Before the actual ceremony, negotiations spread over months of discussion between the parents of the betrothed. Over Turkish coffee and sugar plums, the two fathers sit discussing the bridal dowry, how much the girl is to bring, what the husband-to-be agrees to do for her, and all the more matter-of-fact sides of the case. For the women, this is a time of planning, excitement and hard work. Friends, relations and well-wishers are pressed into unrelenting service to prepare lavishly embroidered blouses, 
wide peasant skirts, all the trousseau that every self-respecting heiress of Venus must have. The mothers of the bride and groom alike are in perpetual conclave to decide the plan of the house and its furnishing. These are supplied by the parents of the bride. As soon as all is arranged, rings are exchanged by the pair. This means that the ceremony may take place at any time. For days before the appointed date, willing hands slave at the bride's house preparing vast quantities of food which will be eaten by the guests. As the guests will include the whole village, and sometimes the next one as well, this is no light task. The volunteers bring bottles of wine, fruit preserved in syrup, bake cakes, make macaroni and a hundred other dishes of the country. Ten best men and the same number of bridesmaids are selected among great scenes of competition. As in the West, it is considered lucky to be one of these. Gaily embroidered clothes and silken pieces are meanwhile being made by the best needlewomen of the community. As they work, traditional songs are sung and a violinist plays over them to ensure good luck for the happy couple. At last all is prepared for the ceremony. Guests pour into the village hall, or the largest rooms of the farmhouse. As each arrives she is welcomed and rose water dropped on her palm by the bride's mother. On these occasions the bridesmaids wear wide peasant skirts and a sort of jacket somewhat in the Balkan and Turkish style. Wide-sleeved of velvet, this waistcoat is tightly caught at the waist, while its front is open and faced with the famed lace of Lefkara. A jaunty headdress in piratical style completes the costume. Then come the dancers. Wearing flat-heeled shoes, but nowadays sometimes western ones, the women link hands and keep time to the lively music, played by a band of violinists. At the end of the tune, the right arm is raised in a dramatic gesture by the dancers, and everyone cheers. There are two dances, the first out in the open, the other inside the house, beside the bridal bed. As the church bells begin to peal, a huge procession wends its way towards the scene of the ceremony. Before the marriage starts, the priest hands out candles. Each guest lights his and these are held in the hand until all is over. One of the lighter aspects of the marriage is when the priest comes to the words to love and obey. As soon as this phrase has been pronounced, the groom treads on the bride's toes to make sure she takes good note of it. Then back to the feast. At the bride's house, cakes and every manner of good things are laid before all and sundry. Quantities of the local sweet, not very potent, wine are quaffed. The newlyweds share a pair of roasted doves to cement their symbolic happiness. The wedding may be over, but the celebrations are not. For at least three more days the dancing, bonfires, fiddling and singing will continue, mostly at the bride's expense. The main course offered at these banquets is called rezi. Made of wheat and lamb, it must be prepared with great ceremony. Girls, singing traditional songs, take turns at grinding the flour, which has been inspected and blessed with considerable gravity weeks before, and carefully locked up so that no evil may befall it. A specially made bed, in whose preparation every woman of the village has taken part, is the gift of the community to the couple. Amid complicated songs and dances, the mattress is made with meticulous care. Aromatic herbs and silver coins for good luck are sewn into one corner. Every little detail of a Cyprus village wedding has its own ceremony, dress and song. While there is no going away on a honeymoon, there is such a burst of jollification and revelry during this entire period of several weeks that it more than compensates for it, as far as the people of Cyprus are concerned. It is refreshing to feel that there are still many who can get so much fun out of their traditional folk life, and who show not the slightest sign of wanting modernity in what is an extremely contented existence. <laughs>